أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم النبي وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته peace and blessings of God Almighty be on all of us uh, yes welcome to part two uh, of a three part series we're doing on uh, you know women in Islam the whole issue of gender equality and women issue because of the recent uh, 16 days of activism and then because of uh, the fact that generally you know women have been on the receiving end of uh, man's uh, you know injustice generally over the uh, you know centuries uh, and even today you'll find that gender-based violence and sort of discrimination on the gender basis is quite rife generally across the broad uh, you know in society and then it will be good to know what Islam is saying about this. So inshallah, we'll be, you know, we started the series last week. We're going to do part two today and inshallah we'll end it next week on part three. But just to remind our uh, viewers there, you know, you know, building bridges between the faiths, uh, we, uh, the Islamic approach is that we are all the children of Adam and Eve, peace be upon them. You see the tree of humanity, the nations, tribes, and all the different, you know, uh, nations and tribes and people of the world uh, the different branches the abrahamic branch in particular jews christians and muslims who are the abrahamic uh, family they form the abrahamic branch and but even though the one is not of the abrahamic family whether one are tribes and nations asia china wherever islam says humanity is one family and islam also preaches that uh, is I shall love all mankind. If you, I don't know if you can see that uh, on the right hand side, in small print of this particular banner, it's from the Quran in chapter 5 verse 32, and it reads, if anyone kills uh, even one person, it would be as if he killed all of humanity, and if anyone saved the life of even one person, it would be as if one has saved the life of all of humanity. So yes, this is the, the, the outlook of uh, Islam to human rights, to human beings. We are all family of the human race and Islam believes in upholding the dignity of all human beings. There are verse in the Quran which says it very nice, Qullu Bani Adam in, uh, in, in Arabic, it, the verse of the Quran and it says the Prophet also said that, uh, you know, we are all the descendants of Adam and Eve and Adam and Eve Adam was created from dust, from clay, so nobody should claim. We're all created from the same entity, so there's no need to discriminate between one another. So yes, we are, as we said, we are doing the series Islam and Women's Right, part two or episode two of this three-part series. And now uh, we also mentioned that, you know, Islam emancipated women 1,400 years ago. Islam is 1,432 years now or, you know, around about there uh, of the Hijri calendar. But I want to uh, emphasize Islam is one thing and what Muslims do in practice is something else. Islam is the religion. Islam's sources, the book of guidance is Quran, the last and final testament to humanity. It is in its original uh, form. It was revealed in Arabic. And uh, the, uh, we also have the books of Ahadith, the, the Sunnah, the example and ways of the Prophet, peace be upon him and those who followed him. So this is where Islam, the sources of Islam are. So the, Quran, the Sharia, the Quran, the Sunnah, the, the example of the Prophet, peace be upon him and his noble companions. However, you know, that is the source, that is the standard. But if there are any Muslims doing anything contrary to that, doesn't mean Islam that represents Islam. It's, it goes for all religions. You know, uh, it doesn't mean if some Christian is doing something that's against the Bible, uh, the teachings of Christianity, that we can say that Christianity is doing this or it's a, you know, that, that religion is promoting it. It's just that that individual is not following the religion. He's claiming to be followed. So likewise here, yeah, let, let us not confuse the issue. We need to separate Islam from Muslims. I think this is what we're trying to say. And Islam from culture, you know, in fact, generally religion from culture. I would even go to the point of, you know, saying that when it comes to this gender issue, I think if you, if you look at it broadly, not, you know, just from, from the Muslim point of view, from, from a broad perspective, one can safely say 
that this gender bias or, or patriarchy, you know, the male dominance thing, idea has been something that's coming from the past, but it is something that's cultural. It's in societies which were not even, you know, Muslim, doesn't matter the religion. It's, it's also a lot to do with culture and society. Uh, and so uh, this is something else to keep in mind. Uh, there are some good in it, you know, some of the practices are good, but some of the other practices that crept in, which are discriminatory, which are not uh, fair to the women, those are the ones that, uh, you know, Islam came to remove. Uh, because when the Prophet, peace be upon him, arrived in Arabia, you know, gender biased, woman was a non-entity, woman had no rights. So he didn't create that, he found that. He, he came into a patriarchal society, he came into a society where the woman, girl, babies were buried alive. We did this in the last episode. But now let's go proce proceed. Now we are going forward to look at some of the issues. Uh, you know, we're going to discuss gender equality, women's rights issues. We're going to touch on the feminist movement also now and then. It'll come to that. Uh, uh, and this is going to be analyzed in the light of Judaic, Christian and Islamic texts. Because, you know, the Abrahamic family, this is program looks at the, you know, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Because these are the three Abraham, we are the Abrahamic family, and we're trying to understand one another and, uh, you know, see the common ground and see uh, where we differ. And we agree to differ. This program is such that we, we respect one another's views, even if we may not accept one another's views. You know, we are living in a, in a society, a uh, diverse society, pluralistic society, and I think it, uh, it, it, it will be good and it is the only the right thing to do is to allow different views uh, and, and respect the different views. Women's rights, we said there is a need for it. We're not denying it because of what we just said that women were, uh, you know, over the period uh, and over the, you know, years and decades and centuries, women were being given a raw deal and being so-called oppressed. Uh, so therefore there was a need for women's rights and feminist movements, but there are certain things that, that you know in this women's rights as I said from an Islamic perspective We will accept but there are certain things that we may not accept also from them Because they may be going overboard from what Islam has to say. So this is the position, you know We are in between now. Here's one issue. Let's let's get into it the male is not equal or same as the female when we talk of equality of rights. We don't talk about equal rights. We can't say men and women have equal rights. Because to say equal, that means you're going to say men and women are equal. Well, no two men are alike. No two men are equal. One may be fatter, one may be older, one may be stronger, uh, one may be more intelligent. They, they are not equal. Same with women. We are all not the same. They, they are, they are, so we are not equal, but there is what we call equality uh, of uh, gender, there's men, all men, uh, we will use the word in a figure of speech, men are equal to one another, but not equal in every respect. They have their differences, what I said, same with women among themselves, they are not equal. And therefore between men and women, they are not equal, but there is equality between them and, and we're going to unpack this. So therefore this is, you know, another very distinction to make when we talk of the rights of women, yes, women have their rights and men have their rights. This is how Islam looks at it. They are like, uh, you know, each one has their own rights in their own uh, unique to fulfill and in keeping with their own unique disposition. So what we are saying, men and women, male and female is not equal, but each one in their own right has, uh, is, is, let's put it this way, the woman has certain things which the man does not have. She is better than the man, than the male in certain things. The man or the male is better than the woman in certain things in, her, in their makeup, in terms of the gender thing. They are not equal. They have been gifted, uh, you know, with different talents, with different unique dispositions and natures, which is a reality. There's no need to discriminate about it. Uh, so the man is not superior to the woman, neither is the woman superior to man. They're supposed to be complementary. And this is the position in Islam 
There is, there is, they are not equal, but they, there is equality and complementary. Uh, there's a nice point to highlight this from the Quran in chapter 3, verse 36. Ali Imran, you know, when we look at the birth of the mother of Jesus, peace be upon her, Maryam alayhi salam, her birth, the mother of Jesus, when her mother was expecting her, all right, when the mother of uh, Jesus, Mary, peace be upon her, when she was still in the womb of her mother, uh, you find that her mother thought that, uh, you know, she's going to have a boy. And then see what the verse says. But when she, and then she was, she made an, uh, a near, she made an intention that the, the prophet Zechariah, peace be upon him, was, was there at his time. And that was uh, her brother, I think, related. And she made a promise that this child, which she thought is going to be a male, she's going to dedicate it. Uh, and give it when you, after weaning and all that, and, and you know, to give it to Zachariah, peace be upon him, Zachariah alayhi salam, you know, for, for God's work, for Allah's, for the deen. But when, when she delivered, as this verse shows in chapter 3, verse 36, the Quran says, when she delivered, she said, oh my Lord, behold, I have delivered a female child. Now she was surprised. She said, oh my God, I was thinking I'm going to have a boy. Now how am I going to fulfill my wish? You see? And Allah knew best what she brought forth. And, and it, the verse continues, and in no ways is the male like the female. This is the verse of the Quran. In no way is the male equal to the female. I have named her Mary, and I have commended her and her offspring to thy protection from the evil one that, that, who is rejected. So here the Quran tells her, doesn't matter if it's a female, you must still go after winning it and give it to Zakaria Salam. Because the female can also do God's work. So stay tuned. We'll be back after the break. Uh, welcome back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So we ended up by showing you how the mother of Mary was told by God Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it doesn't matter it's a girl, it's a female, the female is not like, uh, in, in no wise is the male like the female. They have their own unique qualities, they are not the same. So let's keep this, when we talk of equality and women's rights, the, the, we're not saying equal men and equal women, they cannot be equal. No two men are equal, but there is, the, in, there is equality between them, there is a synergy between them. There is complementary roles between them. Uh, and uh, we'll find that, but in terms of, from the point of view of uh, functions, there are separate role functions, but spirituality and things like that, you know, there is no difference. You find in chapter 16, verse 97, the Quran says, whoever works righteousness, man or woman, male or female, and has faith to him will give or her a new life, that is good and pure and will bestow on them such the reward according to the best of their actions. So in terms of our, you know, roles in society, doing things, uh, spirituality, a woman can be spiritually superior, higher than a man, intellectually higher than a man. We're not talking those things. We're not in those, it's possible those things. But what we are saying, just like that, there is each individual is unique among themselves, each Gender, there's, there's no, no two men are equal, no two women are equal, neither are between themselves they're equal, but they have their own unique specialities, their own unique, uh, you know, traits in them that that's, gives them the edge over the other one, one over the other, and that's how Islam looks at it. Now, let's, let's proceed having uh, discussed this point. The family is the most important unit of society. Now, this, we are going to discuss the role of women. This is another very important, from an Islamic perspective, we have to first look at the Islamic system of life and the structure of Islam and its society, how Islam and the Quran uh, structures its society. The, the, we'll find even today most sociologists will say that the family is the most important unit of society. Not even Muslims saying this, although the Quran is emphasizing this, and in Islam, Islam regards the family as the most important unit of society. There are many other uh, sociologists and scholars who also are, came to this conclusion. Uh, you know, in society, you have different sectors. You have, for instance, the economic, the banking sector. You have in a society, the school, isn't it? The school is one unit of society. The police force is one unit of society. 
the health department and the you know hospitals and clinics it's another aspect which which is more important which is the most important unit of society the hospital the school the police station the bank the local government pile what you'll find that sociologists come and islam says the family is the most important unit of society the family of all those all are important all are interrelated but the most important unit is the family and if you look at this uh, example here of this clip here this image here you see that the family and at the end it's come the family is the first training it ends up with the family is the first you know unit of training uh, if you want how if you if somebody says no the school is more important the teacher is more important then where does the teacher come from a good family will produce a good teacher if somebody says no uh, the the parliament the local government is most important and the politician so where does the politician the politician is not born in a vacuum he doesn't grow up in a hospital the politician is given birth in a hospital but has to come home in a family environment and reared in the first training ground is the is the home the mother the father at the home if somebody wants to say no the money money is important the banking sector is more important so where does the banker come from you think the banker is born in a bank and he grows up in a bank is he has to grow up in a home as a child the the home is the basis the family is the foundation and of unit and society therefore if you look at the next group the family is not just an important thing it is everything this is how islam looks at it so there's a, there's a reason we're discussing this in the gender in the whole equation of gender this gender story that's going on uh, you know discussion family is not just an important thing it is everything so now that we have explained and many sociologists we don't have time uh, you know to go into this but uh, even the, that the, if it, a good family will produce a good individual who will then be a good asset to society see that's how the whole bottom line is so the family is the most important now, why are we saying this we are saying this because in the whole scheme of things between the roles of the man and the woman in society motherhood is priority especially in the first 2 to 3 years of a child's life see what islam is saying now motherhood is priority especially in the first 2 to 3 years of a of a baby you know a newborn baby from birth to 2 to 3 years is a very very important motherhood is more important than any other profession Islam is laying emphasis on this. Today again psychologists are showing that the first 3 years of a child is the developmental and most important formative for the psychological, spiritual, uh, ethical, intellectual, physical development of the, the holistic development of the child. Whatever you're going to put in the first 3 years is what you're going to get out of the child after that. you're not going to get anything more after that the foundation those are the foundation phases and therefore islam says from an islamic perspective motherhood to be a mother and to rear the child is priority so why are we saying this you see what is going on unfortunately in today's society under this impact of women's uh, rights and things one find and career and what have you they say no 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 uh, it's all right I don't I, the child is born after a few months 3 4 months I give it to a nursing mother and the, the woman is going and following her career the mother and the child is being brought up uh, if they can afford a, a nanny and a caring this thing they will do that or if they don't we know the the poorer sectors of society because of circumstances now not because of choice those who are richer and working you'll find some of the mothers because of they're not understanding from an islamic perspective that the motherhood is more important than any other career you may want to pursue after the baby is weaned and whatever i'm going to show you the verse then you can pursue your your, your career and roles in society we're not saying you mustn't get involved but, but if you gave birth to a child motherhood is the priority in islam i'm going to give you the verse uh, you have to breastfeed for two years this is the quran chapter 2 verse 233 let's look at it the mothers shall give such to their offspring a suckle for two whole years they give suckle to their offspring the word such supposed to be suckle they'll breastfeed 
their offspring for two years, if the father desires to complete the term, but he shall bear the cost of their food and clothing on equitable terms. So now, here is the recommendation in the Quran that the mother must breastfeed for two years. Today, go to any clinic, go to any advanced country or any country of the world, go to the health departments and ask them what is better, bottle feeding or breastfeeding. And they'll, everyone will tell you breastfeeding. And they'll ask you how long you got to breastfeed. They say the longer the better. Six months, one year to two years. The eight, I don't have time to go into the, the Quranic verse on, the, on the, the importance of breastfeeding. Firstly, you don't need to warm the milk. Secondly, the, the child is not only getting milk from the mother, the child is getting uh, not only the nutrients from the mother, but the child is getting the immunity. The mother has got already immune systems already, antibodies, and that is being transferred in the milk directly into the child. So the child is getting stronger from an immunological perspective. Then the psychological bonding, breastfeeding and bonding between the child and the mother, the psychological benefit. Well, I, we can, the list goes on, but the Quran said this 1,400 years ago, the breastfeeding. And today you'll find that the World Health Organization and all the, the, the different experts, uh, you know, pediatricians and experts in, in child development will tell you there is nothing better than the breastfeeding. Now, how is the mother going to breastfeed if she's not with the child and bring the child up? So therefore, you find that in Islam, when, when Islam is not against women pursuing careers, Islam is not against women becoming a minister or a local government or an activist, it's not against these things. But if you have a child, if you want to do that, then don't have a child and you plan your children. But if you have a child, then the priority is the child for the first three years. For the next three years, the most important thing, the career, and the most important job of that mother is, 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 for, is to breastfeed the child and to take care of the child. And yes, after three years, you know, you can then get the child into, uh, you know, uh, another care a substituted care and, and because now the, the, the foundation has been laid. So this is very, very important. And then uh, when you still talk about this breastfeeding, we're just talking also about the relationship. This verse is continuing, chapter 2, verse 233, when it's talking about the breastfeeding and that the father must pay the cost, no soul shall have a burden laid on it greater than it can be. It's talking about the husband, the wife and the child. You know, normally you'll find these tensions come when the baby comes. But here the Quran is saying, you know, no mother shall be treated unfairly on account of a child, no father account of his child. Look how beautifully, and each according to the means. What this is saying, it has to be a loving, understanding relationship. The father, mother, and child all have a duty. Each one shares responsibilities to rear this child. You know, there's the African saying, now you're understanding. The, 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 there's an African saying, which is also an Islamic tradition. In, in, in tribal Arabian society, you find that the village, they say it takes a village to bring up a child. Not just the family, but it takes a village to bring up a child. How, how powerful is this African and Arab uh, you know, uh, custom and, 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 and uh, tradition? Uh, all geared up to produce the best child, which will be an asset to the society. Stay tuned. We'll be back after the break. Welcome back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Well, I hope we're getting the, we, we continue with this discussion of from how from an Islamic perspective, we look at the roles of women and men. You know, they are not equal. They all have their own abilities. I mean, the father can't tell the mother, right, you go work and I'll breastfeed, right? The father hasn't, God didn't give the father the, 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 the ability to breastfeed. Or the father can't tell the mother, okay, you go and work and I'll, I'll become pregnant and bring, become pregnancy and I'll do the pregnancy for the child. He's not geared up for it. That's the special, unique, uh, higher gift and, and higher uh, qualities and special qualities which the man cannot uh, even think of, you know, come near 
that high role that God has blessed the woman with. So they, they all have different role functions. This is how Islam looks. In certain areas, the woman is superior and given more gifts and given more, uh, you know, higher or unique uh, abilities than the man and vice versa. This is how Islam looks at society. But now coming to, we just discussed, when the baby is born, the Islamic system is, the priority is to rear this child at least for the first three years. But it doesn't deny the rights of women now. There, there are rights of women in Islam. So let, let's, in, just in case we, 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 you know, we overlook that, we are not overlooking that. Again, in chapter 2, verse 228, it is stated, and similar to what is expected of them, wives have rights according to what is reasonable. So here, <coughs> the, 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 it's between husband and wife, there's rights of the wife and the woman, and there's rights of the husband and the, uh, and the man. You know, normally the people, the, the, when they talk in certain societies, it's like the man, the woman is subservient to the man. The wife is, is become subservient to the husband. This is not so in Islam. There's no ser, ser, servitude. There's no male dominance or husband is dominant. There are areas, there are areas where the woman is dominant and there are areas in a, in a family structure, in, in family roles, where the husband is dominant or has the last say. Let's put it that way. So this is how Islam, Islam defines different role functions in a family and gives the woman certain uh, priorities of her role function over the man and the woman certain priorities over the man in her role function. And this is how Islam looks at that there are differentiation in role functions and they have each, they are unique and, and they are, have, uh, they, are, they have a, uh, what's the word? They have a more, uh, they have rights and they are in a sense superior or they are better suited, right? To do that role function than the other spouse, be it male or female. So here, what are some of those rights? So now the Quran is definitely giving rights to the husband and to the wife. See, there's a balance. Both have their rights. Now let's look at some of the rights. Because of time, uh, you know, and constraints, we did say we're going to go, uh, do three episodes. So, uh, uh, you know, this is the second episode and we'll try and finish it, this whole story of gender equality uh, and gender issues and women's rights from an Islamic perspective. We'll try and finish it in the next episode. What are some of the rights Islam gives? You know, I'm just, we're just giving a few of them here. Love and affection that the woman is entitled to. Protection and maintenance, education, inheritance, rights of inheritance, and decision making and shura where she must be consulted in. So we're gonna look at all of these just very quickly, right? We're gonna look and show you how the Quran and, and the Sunnah, the traditions and example of the Prophet, peace be upon him, by example, he showed us how a, the harmonious system can exist between husband and wife, not with the one domineering the other one or the one subservient or superior to the other one, each one having their own role functions uniquely uh, uh, created to fulfill those roles. And if everyone is doing that, it, it, there will be harmony and there will be stability uh, in the family. And remember we said when we started this episode that, that you know, at the beginning, the family is the most important unit of society. In Islam, I think I must just mention, which I forgot to mention when we were discussing the family as the important unit of society. Very important point that uh, I, for, I omitted. And, and that is in an Islamic system, if, you know, if in an Islamic country, if, which is run according to Islamic lines of the Quran and Sunnah, according to the Sharia, you'll find that uh, the government, if a law comes in that has to, they have to choose where there is a clash uh, of interest or if there is a clash of uh, rights, you may call it, between the individual, the child, and the family. Well, then who will which, which, who take priority? You know, whose rights it takes precedent? Does the rights of the child take precedent to the right of the parent or the right of the family takes precedent? And we'll find in Islam always the right of the family. It, nothing must break the, 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 the harmony and authority and homogeneity of the family unit because the family unit is the most important unit of society. So in a sense, that because the family is the important unit of society, society, if there is a clash between what, will, what is good for society and the individual, in Islam, they will choose what's good for the society 
over what is good for the individual. So you can't talk of my individual rights. The individual rights does not take precedent over the family rights and the societal rights. I think this is what we are trying to say, which I, I forgot to say earlier on. This is a very important point. Unfortunately, you're finding that today, again, this thing is getting mixed up uh, in the, the impact of uh, you know, modernity and under the intact, or impact of all these kinds of rights that we, uh, I'm not against those rights. Uh, you know, human rights, individual rights, individual freedoms, family rights, we, we, we for those rights. But when there is a clash between these rights, between the individual rights and the parental rights and family rights and society rights, uh, there's a lot of mistakes are being made right now, which is with dire consequences and we can see the results of it already in our South African society and in the world at large because we have confused these rights and we have given uh, you know, priority to, a, to, to the individual rights over the family rights and societal rights. So let's come back uh, to, the, to this uh, whole issue of uh, what are the women's rights and wife's rights in, uh, from an Islamic perspective, love and affection, protection and maintenance, education, inheritance and decision and sure Let's start with love and harmony. In chapter 30, verse 21 of the Quran, Surah Rum, it is the Romans, it means the chapter 30, verse 21, God Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and among his signs, among the signs of God Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that he created for you mates, which means spouses, from among yourselves, that you may dwell in tranquility with them. Let us kunu ilay, that you may dwell in tranquility. And he has put, uh, you know, love and mercy and harmony between your hearts. Verily in that are signs for those who reflect. Mu'adda, you know, in Arabic, he has put this, uh, this tranquility and love and affection. It's, this is what binds, you know, the husband and wife and the mother and children and father and children and grandparents. This, this love and harm, what binds us in a family? You'll find, you know, people talk about, you know, how strong they feel about family ties. It's, it is, this is a sign from Allah. This is, this is a gift by the creator who put those bonds. You know, they say you can't choose your, uh, you, you can choose your friends, but you can't choose your family. Your family is your family. You are born into that family. And therefore Allah builds, what, and that family that is so, what's so unique about it? You remember they say, you know, at the end, look, you want the proof of this? You want the proof of what this Quranic verse is saying? I'll put it to you in another way. What this, this love and affection, the bond, no matter all the problems we may have, at the end, when things, when you start falling down, when things start breaking up, you know, in your life, your friends will leave you, your colleagues will leave you, your spouse may leave you, but your family will not leave you. Your family will still stay with you. The, all the wheels can fall down, but the family, this is this love and this bond between family that God Almighty has put. And that is why the family, again, from another perspective, is such an important unit of society. So here's love and harmony, and you know, that, that has to be built up in a family relation, not only between the husband and wife, but between the children and extended family, by the way, parents and grandparents as well. Let's take the next one, protection and maintenance. You remember the second one we said, uh, what does the Quran say in chapter 4, verse 34? Men are the protectors and maintainers of women. Because Allah has given the one more strength or, uh, than the other, and because they support them from their means. So we're just paraphrasing it. Now here again, there's the verse of the Quran that men are the protectors and maintainers of women. This is the general rule. I mean, if they are children, you remember we just said, uh, why is it like that? Because the mother, if, the, if their mother gave birth, so for the next two to three years, she's with the child, breastfeeding, she's at home. Somebody has to go out and earn the money. Not that the mother can't do it, but the, the father can't breastfeed. The father is not good in diapers and changing nappies and, and has that, that instinctive uh, intuition to bring that child up. You know, a mother knows exactly what that cry, when the child can't talk in the first two years, the mother knows what that cry is all about. Whether this child is crying because the child is nappy is wet, is this child crying because this child is hungry, is this child crying because of some other reason. The mother has intuitively been given a superior uh, qualities over the father to identify the cry of the child and to relate with the cry of the child. These are unique qualities. So therefore, when if there is, and, and in Islam, by the way, in Islam, there, an, another principle 
I should just mention, so that we understand this gender issue and women's rights and all, in, in holistically from an Islamic uh, perspective of family and from the overall Islamic uh, uh, ethos of, of how we look at it globally and holistically from an Islamic perspective, you'll find that you need, uh, Islam uh, encourages larger families, not one child and two children. Have more children, four or five at least. So again, the mother is going to be very busy, therefore the father will have to generally be the, the, the breadwinner. So stay tuned, we'll be back after the break. Welcome back, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. To the last segment of this uh, second part uh, episode of gender equality and women's rights uh, from a Judaic Christian and Islamic perspective. We just ended up on the last segment before the break about the men are the protectors and maintenance of women. You remember we're talking about the different, the rights and responsibilities that uh, uh, God Almighty Allah SWT has granted women this was the second one. And the third one, we said education. You know, female education is compulsory in Islam. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said the seeking of knowledge is compulsory on both males and females. So here is again, a, 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 you know, a very important aspect of uh, knowledge and, and education. Islam uh, does not deny that. In fact, it is, it is made compulsory. Talabul ilmul faridatun. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said the seeking of knowledge is compulsory. So, uh, because why? If the woman and the mother is educated, then the child will be educated. Because, you know, in Islam, we said the, f the first three years is what we put into the child, is what we're going to get out of the child. And if the mother is not educated, so what? Oh, that's not much she can put into the child. But if the mother is educated, then that mother will, will, will transfer that knowledge into the child in those formative years. And, you know, th therefore they're saying, in the lap of a mother, a nation is born. You know, in the lap of a mother, a nation is born. That is why the mother is regarded as the first university. You know, and that is another reason why Islam places so much of emphasis on, on motherhood. Now, perhaps you could understand, and there are many other verses to this effect, but I thought I'll just mention it again here. Uh, you know, the Quran talks about the mother and how, how, how difficult it is for the mother, you know, during pregnancy and, you know, the nine months of pregnancy, the pains and discomfort she goes through, the breastfeeding two years, you know, it's not easy. It's not easy. You know, a, a mother goes through all that and it is for that that the God Almighty Allah SWT tells the children, you know, you won't be able to repay, you know, the one, just the one small thing your mother did for you when you were just even in the womb of your mother, you won't be able to repay. And that's why he said paradise, Jannah lies at the feet of your mother. So you can see Islam, what a high position it has given uh, the woman on the other hand. Uh, there's compensation for, for what she, she, ha she has been put to do certain tasks which the man is not so, cannot do. But she's rewarded so much for it that even Jannah lies under the feet of your mother. This is the, the high status that God Almighty Allah SWT gives. And you remember, we'll, we'll, we, we, we'll come across, we did uh, in the first part, and we'll, we'll also do it again as we're ending. On, uh, when we end this, to show you the high status uh, that Allah, God Almighty Allah SWT has given. Let's use the word, the highest status that God Almighty Allah SWT has given the woman, the unique status that he's given to women, uh, which he has not given to the man. He's given to the mother, he has not given to the father. In other areas, he's given to the father and he hasn't given to them. There's a balance of role functions and, and, and unique qualities. So knowledge. So this is very important, you know, just to, uh, perhaps just to round this point up, uh, you know, Aisha and uh, the, the wife of the Prophet, peace be upon him, was his youngest wife. And uh, it is uh, everybody, any scholar of Islam or anybody studying Islam will, will come to know that Aisha Rajwatana was one of the most educated ladies uh, of her time. And she was the wife of the Prophet, peace be upon him. And even after 
uh, you know, his earthly passing on, uh, she, the, the, the companions and, and the presidents of the time, the Amir al muminis the Khalifs, used to come and consult Aisha Radhanana on matters of government and, 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 and rules and, and you know, on, and, and they, they needed uh, what we call uh, opinions from an Islamic point of view. They used to come and consult her. She was the teacher also of many of the companions. She was, uh, she was a teacher in her own right. This shows that this is not just lip service that Islam pays to women. Islam wants women to be educated. However, to, to not to lose sight, I may be emphasizing this quite often, but there's a reason for it so that we don't lose sight of the big picture, that not at the expense of motherhood. You see, uh, there's uh, many causes, many studies one can do at home. While one is at home, it does not preclude one from, from studying. Uh, so if, if, if a mother is, you know, uh, sometimes uh, has to do with child rearing, so it, it does not preclude that. So Alhamdulillah, we did say this is the last segment. Uh, let's just, uh, there are a question that came through. We'll, we'll just, let's quickly answer this question. This came from Abdul. And remember, you must keep your pens ready because we had this last uh, segment, we're going to give you our details so you can write to us. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. I saw that your you offer comparative religion classes. Can we have more details, please? I think uh, we will discuss this uh, perhaps more uh, in the next episode because time is almost on us. Yes, uh, not only comparative religion, but we also offer classes at IFRI, uh, full-time classes at, uh, at the IFRI Center for people who have uh, you know, just newly embraced Islam. You knew in the religion basic causes, uh, you know, uh, for, I don't like using the word revert for those who have come to Islam. We have, and we have advanced classes. Plus, we also have comparative religion classes where we get to learn, uh, you know, the other religions. Uh, but we'll tell you more about those, uh, you know, uh, later on because we just want to get rid of some of these points here. Let's just get uh, your pens out of our contact details because I want to just end with one of another two points about the rights of women. And remember, that's our phone number, 0315075080. Oh, and we have a, a cell number. Or, which is also a WhatsApp number, SMS 0745601786. And our email address is info at ifri.com, box number 60386, Phoenix 4068. You can watch the past episodes of uh, Building Bridges on itvnetworks.tv. Go onto the website, go to featured shows, go to spiritual shows, and then click onto Building Bridges. And also watch the other programs as well. And finally, you can watch the past episodes on, some of them are on YouTube. You go onto youtube.com and you type Rafiq Hassan and you'll find there's over 120 uh, past episodes, the different episodes of Building Bridges, thanks to the ITV team. So as we're rounding up, uh, you know, let's, let's just talk about the right of inheritance as well. You know, we spoke about uh, the, the woman, that she has the right to love and affection. She has the right to maintenance. Then we, we spoke about the right to education, remember? So now let's talk about the right of inheritance. So, the, you know, in Islam, Islam gives the woman uh, the right of inheritance. Now, this is very, very important. Before I go to the Quranic verse, which you see on your screen, chapter 4, verse 176, which are fairly, and few, there are many other verses, I want to just mention and just remind ourselves that this, at the time when the Prophet, peace be upon him, you know, came into Arabia at that time. Women had no rights of inheritance. By the way, even the Western world, if you look at the Western world and go and look at the Western world and the laws of inheritance for women, the women were not even, even allowed to open a bank account, you know, uh, until only recently in Europe, you know, under the, 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 the rights that the women had, uh, you know, it is only in the last few decades that this has happened. But the Quran has given the woman uh, these economic rights and rights of inheritance uh, 1,400 years ago, the Prophet, peace be upon him, gave her those rights. She was an article of inheritance. That was her position. You know, the pots and the pans and all that, if the husband passed away, she was something that was passed on, you know, with the, as a commodity. But Islam came and gave her her own right of inheritance. Look at this verse in chapter 4, verse 176. Many other verses in the Quran. They ask you for a legal decision. Look at this, how beautiful. Legal opinion, the rights. What are the legal rights of the woman? Say, Allah directs it in this way, thus. About those who leave no descendants or accidents as is, if it is a man that dies 
leaving a sister but no child, she shall have half the inheritance. Now it carries on. I'm just giving you one verse. Look at what the Quran is saying there. They want to know now. This was never, this was never practiced. It was not there in the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him. It was not even there for many, many decades, for almost another a thousand years, even after that, even in Europe. You know, and in fact, by the way, Europe was in the dark ages at this time. You, you know that it is only the impact of uh, Islam in Europe, in, in Spain, that brought the Renaissance into Europe. Every historian knows that. And here you find in the Quran that the, here the Quran is talking about that uh, uh, if a man dies and he leaves a sister and no other children, that sister can inherit half, his, she's entitled to half of whatever uh, he owns. This was unthinkable. This was undreamt of in the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him. You'll find this is not there even in, in other scriptures even prior to that. The Quran is the only book that came down as the final and last testament to humanity, giving a woman the right of inheritance. In fact, it goes much, much more deeper, which uh, you know, we will go on in, in, in the next uh, uh, episode when we're ending up. We've got a few more things to round up about the whole issue of uh, woman's uh, inheritance uh, and rights of women, because there's, besides the issue of inheritance, there are a few other rights that uh, Islam gives the woman, and we have to, and we have to compare that you know, from the Judeo Christian point of view, and inshallah, then we'll be able to get a more broader picture as we're rounding out this episode. You know, we are trying to show that besides the rights that has been given to women, there are certain responsibilities that, that rest on the woman. Besides the rights that woman has been given over man, man has got certain rights over woman. So we have to understand. Islam has, uh, looks at the man and woman as a complementary role. They have, you know, it's like the two opposite sides of the coin. You know, you get a heads and a tails. Now, are they the same? No, one is heads and one is tails, but it's the same coin. So I like that the woman have her rights, the man, and if you bring them together, they will have a complementary role to play. And this is how Islam brings about justice and equality uh, between the, 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 you know, the issue of a woman and uh, men and husband and wife and sisters and brothers. There's a balance. Uh, and next episode, uh, we'll be rounding it up and you'll get more verses where the Quran explains this whole concept uh, you know, of uh, rights, uh, of inheritance and overall rights uh, and a balance between man, woman, husband, wife, mother, father, grandparents. So, you know, keep it locked on, uh, you know, uh, tell others about building bridges. Uh, and uh, till we meet again, Khuda Hafiz, we say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.